Right, thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It really is an honor. Uh, I'd like to focus on um, Indian Territory today, I mean, to the state of Oklahoma. And yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> and to wonder how the, the, the creation of Cherokee citizenship as a means to resist colonial oppression actually put the Cherokee people in an ambiguous position west of the Mississippi. So the emergence of the concept of settler colonialism to apprehend the imperial expansionism of the United States in the territories west of the Mississippi did not go without debate. If its integration to the field of indigenous studies is allowed to focus on Native American experiences while facing the colonial power's intention to otherwise dispossess, remove, and eliminate indigenous populations in the wake of the continued colonial invasion of North America, the recent tendency in historiography to take the systematically destructive essence of settler colonialism for granted and consequently to affirm the inherent victimhood of Native Americans is challenged by scholars of new histories who precisely highlight indigenous agency. As indigenous studies have shown, there were occurrences when Euro-American colonists did not get the upper hand and contested places where colonial appropriation and settlement was far from certain. The native ground that emerged west of the Mississippi between the indigenous populations of the Great Plains and the southeastern indigenous populations who underwent deportation in the 1830s is one of them. There, victims of settler colonialism were also agents in the cultural construction of a multi-ethnic space that was not only contested, but also far from being technically appropriated by the American colonial, colonial state. The diasporic movement of the indigenous populations originating from regions of the south southeast of the United States, namely the Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, and Chickasaw, to Western territories illustrate the need for a historiographical reassessment of settler colonialism as a linear process. The position this indigenous populations came to occupy challenges the binary approach imposed by settler colonial studies. These indigenous communities in exile also became invaders of the indigenous West, and the strategies they developed there on allocated lands to secure and adapt to the new environment put them in a position of settlers at the same time, exiles and pioneers. As they underwent deportation beyond the limits of the politically organized territories of the Union, to the outskirts of the American Republic and the regions of the Great Plains where notably the Comanche Empire had long developed, the Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw and Chickasaw faced through dispossession and forced exile the complete annihilation of their social and cultural environment. The loss of land implied the end of indigenous sovereignty in the East, along with the Supreme Court decision to make indigenous nations domestic and dependent in 1831. In addition, uprooting questioned the cultural cohesion of the relocated populations. They were not only confronted to the massive death rates, but also to the need to artificially provide the deported people with a new form of unity away from the land of their ancestors east of the Mississippi. Yet, one may contend that removal to Indian territory could also be analyzed as a challenge to which relocated populations rose. The resilience of the southeastern indigenous populations was indeed characterized by a certain ability of the leaders to maintain the unity of the nations despite internal strife and to affirm the legitimacy to appropriate the lands allocated by the federal government at the very expense of the indigenous populations of the plains. Despite the rupture of forced removal that transposed in the West, the calculated strategy they had developed east of the Mississippi to resist colonial invasion, which consisted in adhering to the American standards of civilization to convince the American government to let them stay on their ancestral homelands. Such strategic mimesis imply not only the exploitation of the technology inherited from the Euro-American settler colonialism system, including the shaping of indigenous nations, a policy that allowed them to oppose the early American Republic using a Euro-American legal language, but also its ideological discourse, which rhetorically positioned the southwestern indigenous nations on the civilized side of the colonial venture. I would argue that the place the deported populations were forced to take in the Great Plains made them agents of the construction of what Stephen H. Long described at the time as the Great American Desert, and somehow by proxy of imperial American expansion. In order to develop what may seem quite a provocative argument, 
The implementation of strategic mimesis east of the Mississippi that resulted in the creation of indigenous citizenship shall be studied first to better apprehend the cultural specificity of the South Southeastern indigenous diaspora. This will help, uh, help us analyze why the removal process characterized also by the pursuance of such a strategy of resistance through cultural adaptation seems to have pushed the frontier farther west as the deported populations participated in the political and technical construction of Indian territory, which, although it guaranteed new forms of sovereignty for the deported natives, made them agents of the American colonial construction as a whole. Among the more than 100,000 indigenous individuals who had been forcibly removed west of the Mississippi, the populations qualified, qualified as civilized tribes were characterized by a certain adjustment to Euro-American culture. Despite their anthropological differences, they shared a common adaptation to the colonial presence on their lands. The sedentary nature of these communities of agri agriculturists favored trade relations with the colonists and the long-term implementation of trading posts. The increasing scarcity of game in, in the South due to the ever-growing demand inferred by the colonists push indigenous communities to develop extensive agriculture and participate actively in a market economy that developed in the region to adapt to colonial invasion and maintain their autonomy. Also, the important phenomenon of, of intermarriages between many Scottish traders and indigenous women led to the appearance of a biracial economic property elite that developed plantation slavery participated in the development of a capitalistic mode of agriculture and took over control, sometimes by coercive means, of the tribal political life. The subsequent centralization of indigenous power through the creation of national councils at the expense of the traditional clan system allowed the new generation of indigenous leaders to implement a strategy of resistance through transculturation that aimed at instilling elements of Euro-American civilization. Seizing the civilizing intent of the early American Republic as an opportunity to wait in the technical and ideological process of Euro-American settlement and delay the moment when they would be annihilated by colonial immersion, they strategically integrated a long-established Euro-American discourse of progress towards civilization. They welcomed the allegedly benevolent Jeffersonian civilization program that aimed at accelerating what was seen as a normal progress of human communities from savagism to civilization, and at making Native American farmers of the agrarian republic who should be willing to relinquish the hunting grounds, assimilate to American society, and disappear. They portrayed their people as civilized Indians who could help advance U.S. objectives as long as they treated as, sorry, as long as they were treated as a civilized, separate nation. The Cherokee, who by the end of the 1810s had adopted a written tradition, self-defined as a nation and resisted their plan, planned annihilation legally in the East as a nation state with a written constitution drafted in 1827. Furthermore, Cherokee citizenship that defined national belonging through race systematically excluded African Americans to highlight indigenous compatibility with the colonial sphere within the frame of civilization and progress. Citizenship as a juridical tool inherited from Euro-American colonization was used as a means for the new Cherokee government to impose a vertical sense of national belonging, belonging and identity. While it aimed at curbing the federal and state's government strategy of getting land session through negotiation with local chiefs, national citizenship allowed for Cherokee self-determination on the territory defined in the Cherokee Constitution and provided each national citizen with privileges and immunities that were supposed to protect them from colonial invasion. For instance, the Cherokee law of October 15, 1829 illustrates the Cherokee government's will to defend cultural and economic protectionism as it stated that an American citizen married to a Cherokee citizen would systematically lose their Cherokee citizenship upon the Cherokee spouse death in case the couple didn't have children. In the same vein, a law of November 1829 stated that in a case of a marriage between an American man and Cherokee woman, the woman kept full authority over her property. As one notices the fear that intermarriages may dispossess Cherokee citizens, 
It appears that the government, while integrating the colonial notion of property to its legal arsenal, aimed at defending purely indigenous interests through American technology. Although Indian removal remains the cornerstones of Jackson's presidency, characterized by the authoritarian passing of the Removal Act in 1830, the project of relocating Native Americans beyond the Mississippi was not new. In the wake of the Louisiana Purchase, Thomas Jefferson had already considered these Western territories for the relocation of indigenous populations as an alternative to assimilation should the latter fail to become civilized. But the American Society for Promoting the Civilization and General Improvement of the Indian Tribes within the United States, created in 1822, played a major role in convincing federal authorities, intellectuals and missionaries alike, that the emigration of Native Americans constituted the most viable and humane solution to racial incompatibility within the American Republic. Grasping the allegedly philanthropic argument that removal was a way to save Native Americans from inevitable disappearance and simultaneously offering short-term solution to Southern settlers and planters who had elected them in 1829, 28, sorry, Andrew Jackson, through the large-scale deportation of thousands of natives, transformed the plan, of the, the plan of the advocates of the creation of an Indian colony in the West into a reality. Indian removal was more than mere relegation. The advocates of indigenous colonization had from the start envisioned Indian territory in the West as a pioneer settlement, where relocated natives would continue to improve toward civilization and bring the benefits of such progress to the uncivilized indigenous populations of the region. Isaac McCoy, a missionary among the indigenous populations of Indiana, content, contended that with the support of federal authorities through the continued presence of American agents and missionaries sent among the relocated natives, quote, the colony would commence and improve much after the manner of all new settlements of the whites, end quote. Not only did McCoy imply that relocated indigenous nations would improve, an argument also mentioned by Jackson in Congress when he insisted that Indians in the West would, quote, pursue happiness their own way, until they could become, quote again, an interesting, civilized, and Christian community. But it went farther in explaining that immigrants to the territory, quote, would be prepared in a larger degree for citizenship. Ideologically, the colonization project underlying Indian removal not only positioned the Indian territory under the authority of the American government, it also led to a form of cultural extension of the American Republic in territories that were not yet organized by the United States. While the imposed dependence on the federal state was the very limit, but also the guarantee of their legitimacy on allocated lands, the in-between position they came to occupy was the only space to be found for resilience. Within the limited latitude, the Southeastern populations turned their ancestral peoples into nation, political nations and found means to develop their influence on the American state in somehow defining the terms of the construction of the frontier. In the West, the strategic appropriation of Euro-American legal technology was reinforced in each nation after removal with the drafting of national constitutions among the Choctaw, Chickasaw, and of course, the Cherokee in 1839. They were modeled after the state cons constitutions of the Union and strategically reaffirmed the legal legitimacy of the nations to occupy geographically defined territories. In the Cherokee Nation, Nationalist Chief John Ross had to face intense internal strife, while the most prominent figures of the Treaty Party were killed by anti-removal Cherokee citizens upon arrival in Indian Territory. Ross managed to secure unity and national cohesion by imposing the Act of Union in 1839 to the old settlers who had migrated west before removal. The long-term process of transculturation within the indigenous nations, which had been at the very core of the strategy of resistance in the east, was reinforced in the Great Plains. The new Cherokee Constitution of 1839 stated, for instance, that, quote, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government, the preservation of liberty and the happiness of mankind, schools, and the means of education shall forever be encouraged in this nation, end quote. 
they are strikingly positioned Indian territory within a certain cultural and economic continuity of the American Republic, as the biracial elite of the Cherokee participated in the development of a market-oriented agricultural system that led to the reinforcement of black slavery in the region. Deported nations were consequently in an ambivalent position. The improvement of colonized lands by deported nations justified, in the eyes of the federal government, their legitimacy to, legitimacy to appropriate the lands of native populations of the plains and make them agents of the reinforcement of southern interest in the construction of western territories. In the meantime, the position of trailblazers was used by the leaders of Indian territory to anchor indigenous sovereignty in the region. The transposition of Cherokee citizenship in the Great Plains not only allowed for self-determination for a nation in exile, in avoiding dispersion, it favored also renewed sovereignty despite dependence on the federal government. While the Cherokee Constitution of 1839 stated that, quote, the lands of the Cherokee nation shall remain common property, but the improvements made thereon and in the possession of the citizens of the nation are the exclusive property of the citizens. The Cherokee law of November 3rd, 1839, insisted that, quote, it shall not be lawful for any citizen of this nation to rent or to sell any farm of a or any improvement in the nation to a white man not entitled to Cherokee privileges. The relocated nations constituted an acculturated population that, according to the terms of the Removal Treaty, was allowed to occupy and exploit territories that traditionally belonged to local indigenous populations. Roughly half of the allocated lands corresponded, in fact, to the important hunting grounds of the Comanche, Kiowa, Kataka, Wichita, and Osage. As they appropriated the lands and secured their geographical integrity facing the resistance of the invaded indigenous populations of the plains, they participated in the creation of one of those multiple frontier societies that emerged in the context of Western expansion, shaped by the antagonistic agencies of groups that were forced to interact. The geographical line that separated the two populations was doubled by a cultural separation line. Characterized by prejudice, southeastern natives had developed towards natives of the plains in the pursuit for civilization. While navigating through the interstices of the American colonial project in those regions, where indigenous domination still prevailed, the southeastern natives got involved on a native ground where they had to adapt to native protocol, dispense gifts, accommodate native diplomatic and military demands, and conform to natives' expectations. Merchants of the southeastern nations got involved in the economic network of the region, formerly operated by the French and the Spanish. Manufactured goods, mostly cotton textiles, were exchanged for horses, mules, furs, and buffalo pelts, but also black slaves. While trading with the peoples of the plains, the southeastern nations aimed at imposing their influence on them and securing this artificially created backcountry. To secure their fragile settlements, the first groups of natives who had migrated to the west called for the support of the federal government, which, in line with the terms of the imposed removal treaties, guaranteed their protection not notably against foreign enemies. In the process, the relocated nations participated in the, in the consolidation of the frontier in a way that also benefited the United States. It was materialized by the buildings of, uh, mil the building, sorry, of military forts on the western borderline of Indian territory, which proved to be a major asset in the American expansion process, while it protected the imposed living space of native migrants. With the support of the government, the southeastern nations also engaged in diplomatic relations with the indigenous populations of the plains. In September 1839, the first intertribal council was organized in the Cherokee capital, Tahlequah, where no less than 11 indigenous nations convened, causing the United States authorities to fear the nations might organize a rebellious confederation against the American Republic. Interestingly enough, no intertribal coalition emerged in the West that could have challenged, even temporarily, the American imperial venture. Instead, the southeastern nations developed a supranational diplomatic structure aimed at neutralizing the indigenous threat to their settlement and 
from the perspective of the natives of the plains, they adopted a paradoxical civilizing attitude that one may argue associated them with the expansionist momentum of settler colonialism that had caused them so much harm. In the fall of 1845, as the Mexican-American War loomed, the federal government sent an expedition in the plains to put an end to the violence committed on the settlers of the state of Texas that had just joined the Union. Important figures of the Southeastern nations joined the expedition, among whom Jesse Chisholm and Elijah Hicks, a prominent member of the Cherokee National Government. The journal Elijah Hicks wrote during this expedition allows one to get more insight on the nature of the diplomatic and cultural interactions at work. There, there were indeed native grounds, contested places characterized by cultural differences on which the civilized diplomats, ideologically strong but in a position of political minority, had to adapt to native protocol and submit to the will of the chiefs of the plains. On March the 5th, for instance, Elijah Hicks in his journal describes his encounter with Comanche chief Buffalo Hump. Quote, a party of chiefs where and women and children appeared and seated themselves in half moon. Young men fantastically dressed, painted with full heads of hair, well dressed in Comanche style and trinketed and appeared well, though somehow effeminate. Hicks adapts to Comanche protocol and justifies his presence to the Comanche chief with the diplomatic humility required. A few days later, yet another meeting occurs, this time with Comanche chief Pahuka. We notice Hicks' need for intercultural adaptation in his words. Quote, Pahuka called this morning and introduced himself, and I did the same in Comanche court style, by hugging one arm over the, over the shoulder and the other below the armpit, and then to the other shoulder and pit. Unquote. Still, what is to be noticed in the speeches Hicks delivers to Buffalo Hump, Pahuka, and other chiefs is the intention to assert Cherokee interests, and at the same time, those of the United States, and most importantly, the civilizing significance of his diplomatic endeavor. The entry for March 11 reads, quote, Elijah Hicks next addressed the meeting and said that he was truly glad to see his brothers and smoke the pipe of, the pipe of peace. This was the way to keep and preserve friendship. The president has sent him to give them this talk, and it was a good talk. The word of the president was true and was always good. The Cherokee knew that it was so. The Cherokee had carried war against the white a great while ago. The president told them to stop, and they did so. He told them to learn to farm and to raise stock, and they done so. And so, they had done well ever since. The reaction of Comanche Chief Pahuka during this meeting is particularly striking. Quote, Pahuka answered the several speeches by stating that he came a long way to see his white brothers, the Cherokee and the Creeks, and he assured them that he was pleased to hear all their talks, and he must say they were good, unquote. Because it is Elijah Hicks' journal, it is indeed difficult to determine whether the, Com the Comanche Chief really considered him and his fellow Cherokee emissaries as white or whether there was simply a missing comma in a transcription. Yet one thing is certain. From the Comanche perspective, the Euro-American Cherokee and Creek diplomats all belong to the same cultural sphere beyond the geographical and cultural line that separated indigenous country and occupied territory. And deniably, this concluding quotes allows for a change of perspective regarding the multifaceted post-removal position of the Southeastern nations. The strategies they developed to affirm their fragile sovereignty in this new environment seem to coincide with the momentum of imperial expansionism indigenous peoples of the plains had to face. The case of Cherokee citizenship illustrates this ambivalent resilience of the Southeastern nations through the ordeal of deportation. While the legal appar apparatus adopted by the Cherokee outstandingly maintained tribal unity despite uprooting, it also illustrates how, to affirm self-determination and sovereignty despite federal dependence, those victims of the American colonial state came to dwell in a house of settler colonialism for survival. Indian territory remained independent, yet under the authority of the American government, until after a failed attempt of the indigenous citizens 
to have it admitted into the Union as the state of Sequoia in, 18, um, sorry, in 1905, it was eventually incorporated into the state of Oklahoma in 1907. In a 2019 article, historian Tia Miles addressed the difficulty of properly identifying the thousands of African Americans who, trying to escape oppression, moved north and west onto violated indigenous lands in the 19th century. Dissatisfied with terms such as black settlers or black pioneers, she suggested new notions be defined, which would reflect more accurately their experience. Indeed, the deportation of the southeastern nations in the middle of the 19th century enabled the federal government to move the frontier line farther west in territories it had not settled yet. Also, at a time when the belief in manifest destiny developed, survivors west of the Mississippi interestingly made relocated natives pioneers and settlers, allowing for territorial construction beyond the limits of civilization defined by the American colonial venture. Yet, the semantic apprehension of the full scope of the Native American experience in the West in such an ambivalent context still needs to be addressed. <laughs>